guys welcome back we are back for some more true crime we are talking obsession dark desires season 2 episode 2 so before we get started this episode is an episode that I watched a few years ago when it originally premiered on Discovery ID and one of our subs which you guys know I like to call my people one of my people Kyle suggested that I watch the episode again so I watched it again the other day and then I decided to do a little more digging a little more research into the actual people that were involved in the crime I realized there were some slight differences in the episode versus what really happened so Go on this little journey with me and then at the end, we'll figure out the differences. So the episode starts out, we're following a lady named Rose Ryan. Rose is a teenager who has been pretty much suffocated by her parents. You know, sometimes as parents, we can really hover and try our best to protect our children. Sometimes we are smothering them. You know what I mean? We don't mean to, it's just sort of natural. Our natural instinct is to protect our children from the outside world. You know what I mean? And that's kind of how Rose's parents were. Her mom, although she was sweet and kind, her father was quite a hard man. He was not the kind of person to give hugs and say I love you. All those things that, that kids need from their parents. So she finally gets out of the house. She's found a place where she can rent out a room. She's super excited about it. She's becoming a typical teenager. She's actually getting into grunge music, rock music. She wants to hang out. She wants to meet people. She wants to become an independent young lady, but also get an opportunity to experience what other teenagers experience. One night she's at the club and she's outside and she ends up meeting a guy named Michael Cartier, who turns out to be not everything she thought he was going to be. She says that when she met him, she realized he was a little bit older than her. She also said she was quite afraid of him because he was a little aggressive and very loud and boisterous, which this is something that's absolutely brand new to Rose. She is not used to being around people that are this vibrant, this out front and in your face kind of people. So she shied away from him a little. A week later, Mike gets in touch with one of Rose's friends and invites them to another show. And of course, she decides, why not? It's her kind of music, it's her kind of crowd, why not? She enjoyed the last time, let's just go and see what happens, so she goes. When she gets there again, her first thoughts about Mike is that he's a little old for her, and that to me would have been a little bit of a trigger. Why is an older guy like him interested in her, and is this on the up and up? That would have been one of my first thoughts. Later that evening, Mike tries to make his move on Rose. You know, he wants to make out and she lets him know that no, she's not interested. You know, she doesn't want to go to that level. And he gets pretty irate and pretty ticked off about it, which to me is sign number two. You don't get this attitude with me. I just met you and I don't want you hugging and kissing me. Give me 50 feet. If you can't understand that, then we should not talk. But this is a different teenager than I was as a teenager. You know, my parents, of course, they were very protective of me, but I still had a little lead way. So I was able to get out and about and meet people and socialize and, you know, learn a few things. I was a little street smart when I was a teenager. After a little while, he got in touch with Rose and asked her to go on a date. She says that she was really excited that, you know, this is going to be really her first date. So she absolutely was excited about it and says, sure, why not? When they went out to dinner, she expressed to him her interest. She was definitely interested in higher education. She was a literary bug. You know, she loves to read everything she can get her hands on. And Mike lets her know that he is not interested in any of that. He doesn't care about her literary dreams. He doesn't care about her educational goals. He was not about that life at all. That to me is sign number three. We do not have anything in common besides the fact that we both like grunge music. Nope, that's another sign. But again, she's a child. She says that she does realize that he is completely opposite from her parents or any of her friends. However, she said that made her very intrigued. She was intrigued to know him. And you can see both sides of that. You could see one side of a person being a little concerned about 
his behavior and his difference, but you can also see someone being interested. He's different from the other people that you know. Why not see what he's about, right? A month after meeting Mike, they're out partying, they're at another club, listening to another grunge band. Mike has introduced Rose to all of his friends as his girlfriend. She is feeling extremely excited and proud that he is claiming her as his girlfriend. And of course, that's how it is when you are 17 and you are just in your first relationship, you are super excited, like, oh my God, I'm his girlfriend. You know how that is. Then Mike steps away to go get them some drinks. Rose runs into someone and the guy is interested in her, but she's letting him know that she's, you know, off the market. Then Mike shows back up with the drinks and totally overreacts, yells at the man and lets the man know you do not talk to my girlfriend. That to me is sign number four. Uh-uh. No, sir, when you walk up here with these drinks, don't be disrespectful. She has already told the man she's not free to date. You need to calm down. That would have freaked me out a little bit. I don't think anything's attractive about jealousy over the top. Now, I have to say, every now and again, a little comment here or there may be a little flattering to a, to a man or to a woman, you know, letting them know that you still care. But that overly aggressive, no, no. Don't do it because that's the fastest way to get you broke up with. Two months after meeting Mike, at, at this point, she's feeling really comfortable with him. So she starts bringing over some of her possessions to his house, like some of her prized books that she is just in love with. Her favorite, favorite works. So one day she's out at a park. She's reading a book and she's waiting for him to show up. Somehow he gets really excited and then all of a sudden, he throws her book in the trash and then throws her over in the trash as well. No, come on, this is trash for the bow, bro. No, we'll get that, my book. We'll get it. Mike. Come on, Mike. Oh, Mike, get it. Come on, out. in we Mike. go. No. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Mike. There you go. Yeah, there's your book. <laughs> through 112 this is done this is done we are not going here but it gets worse go away from me hey. i've been seeing mike for about two months and this was the first time he had ever hit me I told you not to walk away I told you not to leave you're crazy not to leave i told you not to leave <laughs> why what are you gonna do you're gonna hit me again hmm. said that she felt like someone had hit her in a, with a rock and she could not believe what had just happened to her. This man tells her, I told you not to leave because she tried to walk away after being thrown in a trash can. Personally, myself, I would have definitely gotten away from him and called the police. There would definitely be some sort of charges filed against this man. There is no way if I am Rose, I am calling the police, I am pressing charges, I am changing my phone number. This should never happen to her again, dealing with this crazy man. Clearly he is not mentally stable. Then after all of this, he tries to convince her that everything is okay. She's okay, you're okay, there's no blood, you're okay. He starts kissing her and she's kissing him back and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she is a very impressionable young lady and she has no idea what's going on here. I'm screaming at the TV thinking, Rose, please, please don't think that this is the way relationships work. She is brand new to dating, brand new to sex, all of this. Please don't think that this is the way a man shows you love because it isn't, definitely not. Rose says what struck her at the time is that she had really strong feelings for him, but at the same time on the inside, she was crying for her mom and she just wanted to go home. As a parent, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, Rose, why didn't you go home? That was, the, was a sign. You want your mom, go be with your mom. Leave this man alone. You need to run as fast as you can, Rose. She also says that she realized then that he could get extremely violent and that she felt really nervous, but at the same time, she wanted to comfort him. She also said that she realized that it could get worse, but she thought this is the only person in the world that loves her. And 
That is sad and not true. Her parents may be a little awkward, you know what I mean? But I know that they have to love her. She has other friends that love her. This man is not the only one in the world that's gonna love you. And that's what a lot of abusers do. They want to convince the man or the woman that they are abusing that nobody else will love them. Nobody else will want you. That is false, very, very false. And I wish somebody was there to share that information with Rose right away. She takes his violence towards her as a way of him showing that he loves her. So his plan works. Every abuser wants their victim to believe that, oh my gosh, him beating me or her hitting me or ramming my car, that means they love me. No, it doesn't. That means that they are mentally unstable and you are unsafe. Run, because you are in danger. Later, she finds out that Mike has some issues with his family. He's very, very angry with his mother. It turns out his mother left him and she left him at a very early age and he shared this information with Rose. Then he gives her the story that he wants to be good, he knows that he should be good, and that she makes him a better man. Isn't that what they always say? Oh, it's because of your love. It makes me wanna be better. I'm gonna be better and it's because of you. But in the meantime, I'm just gonna beat you and drag you to death. No, thank you. But of course, Rose being young and impressionable, she's there for him. She wants to comfort him. She wants to let him know that she loves him and she won't leave him. She ends up telling him that she's in love with him, that she loves him, and he gives her one of his silver chains as a token of his love for her as well. She admits that in her family, they were not the huggy, feely type. So she was extremely thirsty for love and affection so she was really, really sucked in by the attention and by him telling her that he loved her and him calling her his girlfriend, which unfortunately that happens a lot. It happens a lot. And there are tons of women, tons of women who did not get that love at home and they end up finding it in the worst men possible. And that to me is so sad and painful. And I'm thankful that I grew up in a family that told me they loved me all the time. Because that is important. It is important that our children feel love, they feel value, they know that they are worth everything. Because if we don't instill in our children that they are worthy, that they are smart, that they are funny, that they are beautiful, that they are loved, some of them will fall victim to people like this. Then out of nowhere, he buys her a beautiful cat. Now, I love animals, I really do, but I'm scared of animals. Like I'm scared of everything, including cats. Anyway, on the show, this little cat that he gave her was so gorgeous. I wish I could reach into TV and make him mine. I mean, it was the most adorable cat I've ever seen in my life. Well, he gives her this cat and she's awakened to him screaming his head off because the cat has gotten fur on his jacket. This guy throws the cat in a shower. Mike! Huh? Picked the kitten up and threw it in the shower and turned on the hot water and the cat was screaming. <laughs> he took a disposable razor and shaved the kitten. I was crying. I thought, what in the hell? Rose says that she can just recall over and over in her head the screaming, the pain and agony that her cat went through. That poor cat lived a miserable life, short life. I mean, she didn't leave. She did not leave. There is no way in hell, no way in hell that I do not get that cat to the nearest vet hospital, let them know exactly who did this to this cat and where he can be found. And this is my cat and I do wanna press charges. I mean, what? No way that I'm staying with somebody like that. I, I, 
I was a little ticked with Rose. I really was. I said, now listen, I know she's young and everything, but come on, this is an innocent baby cat. It devastated me. Rose said from that time on, the cat spent most of his life hiding under a bed. I mean, is anybody surprised? Of course, he's scared. What else was he supposed to do? I, I wouldn't feel comfortable prancing around the house. No way. On the night of October 4th, 1990, Michael begins drinking with some of his friends and went on a complete rampage. He took a sledgehammer and started beating it through the walls of their apartment into the neighbor's apartment. He had smashed through the wall with a sledgehammer in the apartment next door. He terrified those people. They called the police. He also killed their kitten by throwing it out of a fourth floor window. That poor cat. She mentions the cat being thrown out of a window sort of in passing on the show, but when I read the article, it was absolutely devastating. I mean, that poor cat, why did he buy the cat for her? You know what I mean? Like, why would you buy this woman a cat if you're not gonna let her love it and let the cat love her? This is just ridiculous to me, totally pissed. The night that he went on this rampage, Rose had snuck out of the house. So she wasn't there when he tore up the apartment and when he threw the cat out of the window. She was totally shocked when she got home and found the police there. If you leave me again, I'll kill you. Yeah, come on. Oh, what now? First of all, you were in handcuffs. You're threatening me? At that moment, she had the opportunity to tell the police, this dude just threatens me. Can we add some more charges to him? I mean, nah. -uh. That to me also says he's going to jail. He's going to be in there at least for a night. You have the prime time opportunity to pack up whatever he has not destroyed and go. And then later she says that he bragged about what he did to the cat. He bragged about hurling that cat out of the window. Wow. He ended up being evicted from his apartment. He also called her to let her know that he didn't remember anything that happened. He tells her that he was totally blacked out and just lost control and he couldn't help himself, I guess. Then we go back to the whole thing that abusers do when they start calling you. But I love you. I love you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I swear I'll never do it again. I promise I don't know what happened. I blacked out. I lost control. I need you in my life. You help me. You make me a better person. Yeah, F all that. We're done. Go be a better person, honey, by yourself. If you really want to be a better person, get help. Get some therapy. Go check yourself into a mental health hospital because clearly there is nothing that she can do for you. She finally realizes that she needs some help. And I was thankful that she realized that. Six months after meeting Mike, she finally asked him to please stop calling her, leave her alone. She tells him, I don't want anything to do with you. However, like other abusers, he, he continues all the phone calls. She said that the phone calls were all day, all night, nonstop, and this goes on for weeks. Now this is where she makes a mistake and unfortunately a lot of victims do. She says that she was feeling bold. So she decides to go over to his place to pick up a few of her things. That is a no. Okay, anything that you left over there, let him have it. Let him have it. It's never a good idea. It's never a good idea to go back. It's never a good idea. She truly believes that she's going to be able to just come in, grab her stuff and go, and that there's not going to be any problems. She says that not only was he crazy, he was also paranoid and animated. He tied this woman to his bed. Shut up! Calm Shut down, up! Calm down, if I say you're not leaving, you're not leaving! Calm down, Mike, Mike. Shut up! What, you think you're my mom? No. You think you could just leave me here? Is that what it is? You think you could just leave me? <laughs> As a grown-up, I wouldn't be prepared. So you know as a 17-year-old, you are not ready for any of this. 
He held her in his apartment tied up overnight, raping her. She said that there was a little window over the bed in his apartment and she kept wishing that she was small enough that she could just crawl out of there and run. And he continued to tell her throughout the evening that if she left him, he would kill her. She said that she went somewhere deep inside of herself and she isolated herself inside. However, she said there was a voice in her head that said, you have to do what you have to do to get out of this. You have to get out of this. So when she wakes up the next morning, this dude is staring her dead in the face, reading some passage out of this book to let her know that they are meant to be together. The only thing that is meant is for this man to be in a mental facility. This man tells her that he loves her and he knows that she loves him as well and that everything is gonna be okay. They're gonna be together. So of course, her thinking as a survivor, she agrees, oh yes, you're right. We are definitely going to be together. You gotta make nice to people like this in order to get free. And she does, she plays the game. He lets her go. She runs, of course. She goes back to her parents' house she said that even though she was with her parents, she felt safe, but she did not feel completely safe. When she gets to her parents, she does not tell her parents anything. She doesn't tell anybody anything. She says that she didn't even call the police because she didn't believe that the police would believe her or that she would be supported and he would be arrested. Oh my God, little girl. Seriously, Rose, call the cops. I was so ticked. I'm like, girl, you got to trust somebody. Tell somebody. But she didn't. The next thing you know, Mike starts calling her parents' house. He is calling her parents' house constantly, day in, day out, leaving messages on their voicemail. He was back to that same old thing. I love you. I love you. I need you. I can't live without you. She says that she asked her father to change their phone number to an unlisted number, and he told her no. You went on off to Boston to live your life and got yourself into some mess. Handle it yourself. Personally, I say her dad is a complete jerk. Change the number, dude. Try to help your daughter out. Call the police. Don't just dismiss her like this. This is still your daughter. Rose says a few weeks go by and she doesn't see him at all. So she's out on the subway. I just want you to know that I have a gun. And uh, I know how to use it. I'm gonna kill you. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Rose, of course, she says something to a uniformed man on the train. And Mike says, oh, this is just my girlfriend. And the guy walks away. I'm thinking, what? This woman is just now telling you that this dude is threatening her. The man walks off. She gets off the train and she's nervous. She's scared out of her mind. She's walking really fast, but trying to look around everywhere because you don't know where this guy is, right? He jumps out of nowhere. Gotcha. Luckily, she's able to get away. She just has a few scrapes, a few bruises, but she gets away. She gets home and her mom is trying to clean her up, trying to see what's going on with the bruises. Her dad with his negative, nasty attitude comes in and says, oh, now what? And she lets him know the entire story, the attack in the subway, everything. She lets him know all the stuff that has been going on. Her dad was not supportive at all. He said, you went to Boston, you wanted to live on your own and go to these clubs. I say you had it coming, it's your own damn fault. Say what now? What kind of father says that? What kind of father says that? As a matter of fact, take father out. What kind of a man says that to a young girl who has been attacked, raped, and beat up? Yikes. She says that that was just the kind of man her father was. So she tells her sister and her sister decided that she was gonna be supportive. She was gonna be there for her. And her sister takes her down to the police then they go off to court and they end up running into this idiot on their way into the court. 
I'm telling you right then, that man is lucky that he didn't run into me and my sisters, okay? Because the both of us would have whooped him. Do you understand? The police and all the security, the deputies in the court, they'd have ran out and arrested us. We, he would have been able to get a restraining order against us because I would, we would have tore him up. Let me tell you, her and her sister sort of shied away. They shrunk away a little scared. I guess they were just trying to be professional. No, no. Me and my sister, we're not about to be professional with you. I mean, it's the two of us. We can take you. This is not about to happen. I was so ticked. I said, what are you doing approaching these women in, in broad daylight in front of the court? That was awful. And I felt for her and her sister. Michael Cartier was charged with assault and battery and they gave him a one year sentence and five years of parole. So at this point, this woman had been physically attacked, punched in the face, attacked with a pair of scissors in the subway, held hostage and raped. And all he gets is one year, one year and five years parole. Where's the justice in any of that? Once he went to jail, she moved out of her parents' house and she got her own apartment in Salem. Everybody told her, he's in jail now. You're okay. You're okay. Get out. Live your life. And she said that she still had night terrors and she was still frightened out of her mind, which can you blame her? Seriously, I would have been frightened too. She said that he was still making threatening phone calls to her. He was sending her letters and she was wondering what is going on. I personally thought you moved out to Salem to a new apartment. How did he get your number? What? I don't know, but she said that he was calling her. She said that even though she was on her own and he was in jail, she still carried weapons. She said she would keep steak knives under her bed. She would keep steak knives in her drawer. Like she was, she was armed up, honey. She was, listen, I don't blame her. Not one bit. It says that she remembers praying at night that he would kill himself in prison or somebody would kill him. And again, I, you know, I don't pray for anybody's death, but I understand. Two years after meeting Mike, she says that she was not interested in dating. She was not interested in men at all, but she did have one guy friend that she trusted. And this guy asked her to go to a concert. And she said she knew that it was the type of music, same type of concert that Mike liked, but it's been two years. So she was going to give it a try and she was going to go. And I said to myself, why try? Mm -mm, no, don't go. Stay away. So... I'm gonna stop there because the show went on to go in a whole different direction and tell a story that wasn't absolutely true. They didn't give you all the information. It turns out that Rose Ryan actually fell asleep and didn't make it to that concert that night. So, you know, that was good. She didn't have any chance of running into this guy at all. However, Michael did end up killing someone that night, just wasn't Rose. It turns out that a couple months before, he started dating a young lady named Christine Lautner. Christine thought when she originally met Michael that he was awesome. He was cool, he was different, he was funny, and they went out on a few dates. It only took a few dates for the real Michael to show up. She dated him for two and a half months and then she broke things off the morning of April the 16th. It turns out that on April 16th, she was out a few blocks away from her apartment and he beat her. It seems that they became involved in some sort of argument and he knocked her to the ground and started kicking her over and over and over again. She remembered him saying to her, get up or I'll kill you. She staggered to her feet, a car stopped and two men assisted her home. Since that evening, he continued to call her and call her and she refused to see him. She said that the calls kept coming in 10 to 12 a day he told her that if she reported him to the police, he may have to do another six months in jail. However, she better not be around when he gets out. From the beating that she received from him, she suffered hematomas to her legs and reoccurring headaches from all the kicks. 
that he continued to kick her over and over again. She did call the police right away. She also ended up calling a place called Emerge in the hopes of getting him admitted to Emerge, which is a medical facility, with the hopes of him getting some mental assistance. When she called the facility, someone named Ellen Horn told her, listen, he could kill you because she's leaving him and things could get extremely dangerous. Know that he preyed on women and was clearly disturbed. He once talked about killing his mother. They found out that when he was five or six years old, he dismembered his pet rabbit's legs. When he was 21, he tortured and killed that kitten. In a bizarre 1989 incident in Anover restaurant, he injected a syringe of blood into a bottle of ketchup. He was a very, very brutal man. And it turns out that at 5 p.m. on May 30th, Kristen left her job as a cashier at a liquor store on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. She returned to the area about an hour later to meet up with another cashier who was just getting off from her shift. Mike shot her once from behind. Moments later, she lie wounded. He shoots her two more times. It turns out that three weeks later, the incident report that she reported to the police regarding the original fight that they had when he beat her originally had still not been typed up and turned in. Had the officer immediately typed up his report, turned it in, hopefully the probationary office would have came and arrested him for violating his parole by beating yet another woman. Kristen was just 21 years old. She was a student of the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And her father wrote a book about it. He was devastated at the loss of his daughter. And it was his mission to learn everything he could about Michael, and what happened to his beloved child. And you can understand that. Her father was devastated and so was Rose. Rose said that when she saw the report on the news about a student being murdered and that they had also suffered from domestic violence, she said she immediately knew that it was Michael. Michael ended up going back to his apartment and killing himself. A coward to the very end. This story struck me and my hope is that by Rose coming forward telling her story, and by Mr. Lautner writing his book that other young women, older women, men even, will learn. When a person shows you who they are the first time, you need to run. Sometimes you have to hide and other times you have to fight. But you need to take this seriously. I am so sorry for all the families that were involved and all the people that were hurt. I wish them all the very, very best. And until next time, bye.